Good afternoon. All right, you've just submitted your last homework assignment. <clears throat> I'm going to grade that one myself rather than give it to the grader. I'll try and get it back to you as quickly as possible, but I don't know if it'll be ready by Thursday. So if I grade it after that, I'll uh, probably leave it up in the area by the secretary's office, and I'd send out an announcement to the class when that's ready for you to pick up. Let's talk about the project. <clears throat> your final submission is due on Thursday, and uh, both a paper copy and a digital copy has to be submitted by 5 o'clock. Um, if you choose to turn it in after the class time, then you need to bring it up to my office. And I'm on the third floor of the main building, room 329. Uh, if I happen to be out when you pass by, just slide it under the door. Hopefully it's not too thick. I, I can accept a paper that's maybe this thick, but if you've really done a lot of research uh, and it's too big to go under the door, there is um, an administrative assistant that's in the office across from mine. Um, and you could give it to him if yours is so thick it won't slide under the door. So, any questions about the project? And the final exam, of course, is coming up as well. We've already talked about that. So, uh, just as one additional reminder, we're doing that on the 14th of January. Today we're going to begin with the course outcome survey. And uh, this is my first semester back at AUS, and so it's my understanding you've already done the course evaluation, like the teaching evaluation part. This, I'm sure you've done these before, is a little bit different. This isn't about me. This survey is about you. It's about what you learned. And so on this, it's the list of our outcomes from the syllabus, stuff like uh, calculations related to kinetics and mass balance and so on. You know, there's, I think, uh, 10 of these outcomes. And so what you're doing is you're saying, whether you agree that you learned it or disagree that you learned it. And so five indicates that you really strongly agree that you learned the material, and one would indicate strongly disagree, meaning that you didn't learn it. So let's pause for a few moments here. I'll hand these out, give you some time to complete the... What did we talk about last time on Sunday? All the way, 48 hours ago, you've done a lot since then. You've probably crammed in other courses, working on projects, but what if we had a pop quiz and the only question was, what did we talk about two days ago? Population. Population, okay, yeah. Sustainability of water resources and population, right. <clears throat> so today, we're talking about um, sustainability as it relates to energy resources. Question? Easiest way to do that, I'll just give you an extra set of lecture notes. There you go. Okay, so let's come back to this definition of sustainability, and I've changed it slightly. And by the way, today we're talking about energy resources and sustain sustainability. Um, we've got one lecture to talk about something that you could spend an entire career studying. And so this is by no means comprehensive or exhaustive. We're just scratching the surface in a very, uh, very light way. <clears throat> okay. So I've changed this definition of sustainability to focus more on the energy side of things, which we're talking about today. But the core remains the same. Uh, the main emphasis of sustainability is that you're meeting the needs of society without compromising future generations. Uh, and so um, not degrading the ability of people who come after us to have the same things that we enjoy. Renewable energy resources are those that can be replaced <coughs> within, a hu within a few human generations is what we used when we were talking about resources in general. But most of these are replenishable on an instantaneous basis. In the case of solar, wind, and to a lesser extent, hydropower. Biomass is kind of a seasonal thing. When we're growing fuels that we burn, like wood or uh, corn, ethanol, things like that, biomass fuels take a little bit longer than instantaneous to regenerate. But then the non-renewable energy resources are those that are replenishable only on a geologic time scale, coal, gas, oil. You'll notice that I didn't put nuclear in either of the categories. 
And that's because it's a little bit of a gray area. Some environmentalists love nuclear power, and some environmentalists hate nuclear power. Uh, our next class is talking more about ionizing radiation, and so it'll focus a little bit more on nuclear. But uh, in, nuclear power does have a role in the discussion we're having today. In some sense, it's a renewable resource because uh, nuclear fuel can be um, uh, remanufactured, and they have things called breeder reactors where uh, the, the nuclear fuel can be replenished and reused multiple times. But in another way, it's a mineral like any other that has to be mined from the earth, uh, like uranium and plutonium have to be uh, produced from an original source. And so I wasn't quite sure where to put nuclear fuel in terms of renewable versus non-renewable. Like any re energy resource, it has advantages and disadvantages. And even among these renewable energy resources, they're not all uniformly positive things. Uh, solar power, for example, takes up a lot of land area. And there are rare earth metals required in solar power that if you're trying to produce those earth metals, it can, be a very, it can cause a lot of pollution. The same is true with wind. Wind isn't only a good thing. It is a good thing overall, but it has some disadvantages. And one of the big disadvantages that people have sided with uh, those turbines that generate wind is that they can kill birds. You know, birds will fly through them, get struck, and so migrating birds uh, are at risk from uh, the big wind farms where there's these blades turning around at a really high speed. Hydropower is another one that, like nuclear, there are environmentalists who like hydropower because it's clean. There's no atmospheric um, emissions from hydropower. But the problem with hydropower is that you have to flood areas that previously uh, weren't lakes or rivers. And, um, and so you're sort of degrading and changing the, the movement of water, and uh, it can destroy habitat. Oh, you're talking about the wind power? Well, I guess if they put like a screen around it, the, uh, the first thing is that it would cause drag, and so that would reduce the amount of wind that can get to the blade. But there are birds small enough that they'd have to put the screen size very, very small. And, and so if it was, you know, the mesh was fairly large, that's not going to keep away the small birds. Um, I think probably it's just, why don't they do it? It's because they don't care that much about the birds. <laughs> You know, the cost, the, in the view of the electrical power company, they're not going to do something until they're regulated and required to do it. And so far, they're not required to do it. And I think there's probably, at this point, not so many wind farms that it's causing a huge impact on bird populations. But if that became a primary source of electricity in any one place, then we'd probably see the effects of it a lot more. Biomass. Has anybody heard what some of the disadvantages of fuels like ethanol are? Ethanol is alcohol. And there's lots of different ways to produce alcohol. Some people ferment potato, potatoes. Some people ferment fruit. But uh, on a worldwide basis, when alcohol is used as a fuel, the two main ways of doing it, in Brazil, they use sugar cane. And in the United States, they use corn. And both of those fuels, um, displace food that could have, got, could have gotten into the world food market. And so corn prices go up, and it makes it harder for people to afford fuel, even though people in rich countries pay just a little bit more for their gasoline that has alcohol mixed into it. Um, the, the impact can be really huge on people who live in countries that are poor and rely on food crops like corn. And the same thing is true, like in Brazil, um, you know, maybe the poor people aren't eating a lot of sugar, but the land that's set aside to grow biofuels could have been put into production for food crops. Instead, it's being used for sugar cane that's going to be turned into uh, ethanol. So there's disadvantages even among the renewable energy resources, but each of these is better for the atmosphere, for example, than coal, oil, and gas. Um, <clears throat> the next slide is going to show energy consumption for some of the highest countries in the world, the countries that use the most uh, energy per capita. Now let's just look at it directly. The first one is the Virgin Islands in the United States. And that's a small 
chain of islands in the Caribbean, has a population of about 100,000. And the reason why they use so much energy in the Virgin Islands is it, it, there's two reasons. Number one, the people that live there have a lot of money. And number two, there isn't a good system of central production of electricity. And so people there are using small generators, which are very inefficient. It's more efficient to have a big centralized electricity production plant rather than everyone having their own gas-powered generator. Those small generators have a horrible efficiency. Uh, and so they have the money to spend it, and they do spend it a lot of fuel because it's so inefficient. In Gibraltar, it's a similar situation, except for what compounds the issue in Gibraltar is that a lot of their water comes from desalination. And so you have both desal uh, decentralized electricity, inefficient production of electricity, and desalination. So these are both relatively small places, Virgin Islands and Gibraltar. The rest of these countries are a little bit more mainstream with larger population, and it's not such a specialized reason for why they're using a lot of uh, energy. As you might expect, Qatar, the reason why they're using a lot of energy is because they have a lot of energy. It's a very wealthy country with huge reserves of gas, and like most of the Gulf, they're getting their water from desalination, and that has a huge impact on how much energy is used per capita. Um, Iceland is kind of an interesting example. Anybody know what the, what the uh, power situation in, in Iceland is like? Yeah. It's geothermal, exactly. Yeah, it's right where two plates are meeting. Um, in the middle of the ocean, two tectonic plates are coming together. And because of that, the geothermal energy is very close to the surface. And so they have so much energy in Iceland, they use it to do things like they heat the streets so that the snow will melt. In Reykjavik, they heat the streets, which it would be absolutely impossible to do anywhere else if you were burning fuel that cost money, but they just have this unlimited supply, essentially, of, uh, of really nice warm water. And uh, I visited Iceland this summer, and they have these outdoor swimming pools that are heated, and they can do some really amazing things because of essentially unlimited and very low-cost energy. They're starting to do things like uh, they put an aluminum smelter in Iceland to try and capitalize on the fact that the energy there has a very low impact on the planet. So if we can do things there in Iceland that otherwise are requiring fossil fuels, then it's a net benefit for the planet. So the rest of these you can see it's a decreasing per capita energy use. Uh, the United States, it looks small, and on a per capita basis, maybe it's smaller than some of the others, but the population in the United States is much larger than probably the combined population of all of the other countries before it. And so on an absolute basis, rather than on a per capita basis, on an absolute basis, the United States uses a hugely disproportionate share of its energy resources. And let's look at the U.S. in a little bit more detail. And the reason why, like I said last time, is because there's a lot of good statistics and they've been taking statistics for a long time in the U.S. And so we can see how things have changed uh, over the course of technological progress. Back in the olden days, people were mostly getting their energy from wood and a little bit from coal. But um, wood is a difficult resource to get your energy from because, number one, cities usually aren't very close to forests. You know, there's some distance between the wide open land that has a lot of wood and where people congregate and live together. So as populations grew and the populations became more urban and less rural, uh, wood wasn't able to satisfy the demand for energy like it had in the past. And so for a long time, coal was the substitute for wood. It's more energy dense, meaning that there's more energy per volume or per mass than wood because it's been compressed and uh, the water has been driven out in the case of coal. But around the turn of the century, other sources of energy were discovered and exploited. Liquid petroleum resources, natural gas, over time you can see that nuclear became a part of the energy use in the United States. And just a tiny sliver here in blue, that's the hydropower. There's a, one other thing I want to point out about this slide, and that is the GDP, this red line. 
And so there's a very close uh, correlation between how much energy is being used and the uh, GDP of a country. And GDP stands for Gross Domestic Product. And you can think of it as uh, how fast the economy is working or how big the economy is of a country. And so without energy, in our modern economies, it's difficult to have a job if there's no energy. You know, they'd send us home early if the power went out to the university. I mean, I could still talk to you, and you could still listen, but without PowerPoint, how would we learn, right? Um, and that's sort of a joke in a way, but, you know, even if we didn't need PowerPoint, there's the lights that have to be on and the, the cooling. And so um, all of the activities that we're engaged in for an economy are very closely related to how much energy is available. And so one of the great challenges of the next century is trying to decouple those two. Because everyone sort of agrees that we have to use less energy than we've used in the past. That it's so difficult to produce energy with renewable resources that we have to wean ourselves off of natural gas, petroleum, and coal. Because those are the three energy sources that contribute to atmospheric change. It used to be thought that in addition to climate change, the other big reason for needing to get away from those fuels is because our supplies were going down. Uh, until very recently, people focused a lot on the concept of peak oil. And you can see that uh, on the vertical axis here, this is the proven reserves. And so this is how much energy we know about. Uh, you know, we've done the exploratory wells, or maybe they've done uh, remote sensing experiments. And, where they know there's coal, natural gas, and oil. And so for a long time, our proven reserves were going up. But then proven reserves started going down. And the reason for that is as simple as the mass balance that we keep coming back to over and over again in this class. Accumulation is in minus out. And so this graph is our accumulated energy resources that we know about. And for a lot of years, we were discovering oil faster than we were consuming oil. But what does it mean when this line is going down? Consumption is more. Yeah, we're driving more than they're starting to find new reserves. And so, People were really panicked for a long time about the idea of peak oil. And that's why oil prices got so high. Uh, for a long time, they were really high. But now oil pipe prices have crashed. Why is it that the oil price now is below $40 a barrel? And during the, the peak of, I think, the peak prices was maybe around $140 per barrel. Why the difference? What's that? Yep. In the past, they were limiting production, and now they're not. Um, but that wasn't all about, that, that wasn't the only reason. It wasn't all just about intentional limiting production. It was actually that there was a scarcity then, and now there's not. And um, it's because of a new technology called fracking. How many of you have heard of fracking before? Horizontal fracture? Instead of traditional wells, which they drill down and then just pump the oil out, fracking is a new technique where they drill down and then they start drilling sideways. For several kilometers, they'll dr drill sideways. And then, once they've drilled sideways, they'll pour water into the hole. And then at the surface, they'll pressurize that water very suddenly. And what it does is it breaks the rock underground. And then the oil and gas starts to seep into the well that they've dug. And so that horizontal fracture is a new technique that was developed. And suddenly, the United States was able to pump a lot more oil than it ever had before. This graph uh, that I've just pulled up on screen is the proven reserves of oil in the US. And you can see the US was running out of oil. It was starting to become more and more dependent on importing oil from outside. But then suddenly, this new technology took off, and its proven reserves are skyrocketing. Just within maybe a 10 years' time, They've made up a huge amount of the oil that had been consumed, and this is still ongoing. And, and so that's why oil prices are low right now, is there's a new, a new technological uh, discovery, horizontal fracking, 
that is adding a lot more supply to the market. So we used to have two reasons to wean ourselves off of fossil fuels, um, climate change and reduced supply. Now one of those reasons, the reduced supply, isn't so much of a reason as it used to be because of the new technique. But still, we should move away from fossil fuels because eventually we'll run out no matter you know, what new technique they come out with, there's only a certain amount of fossil fuel within the black box that we're living in. Uh, but then the main reason is, of course, climate change, and we're already starting to see the effects of that. Any questions or comment, uh, comments so far? All right. Well, let's talk about one of the renewable energy sources, and that is hydropower. You probably remember from fluid mechanics that uh, you can calculate the power of a moving fluid as a function of the flow rate, Q, the unit weight, gamma, and the head. H sub T here means the head of the turbine. And so the turbine head, how much energy there is that can be extracted from a uh, hydropower situation, it depends partly on the, the movement of the water, the flow rate, but also the elevation difference between the upper reservoir and where the water comes out. So in your in-class example, everyone has a copy of the paper, right? I'd like you to calculate how much power in terms of kilowatts can be generated for the situation that's described here. We know the elevation of the upper reservoir. We know the elevation of the outlet where the wet water is discharged. This head loss is uh, due to the frictional losses as the water flows through this pipe. This pipe is called a penstock. That's the name of it in a reservoir. We know the diameter of the penstock and the velocity of the water as it flows through the pipe. So with the diameter and the velocity, you'll be able to calculate the flow rate Q. Anybody remember what the unit weight of water is in terms of newtons per cubic meter? 9810 newtons per uh, cubic meter. So gamma, gamma is 9810 newtons per meter cubed. Yes? All right, so the last part of it is efficiency. In this example, <clears throat> we multiply by the efficiency factor because it's going to reduce how much energy can be taken out of the system. In the next example we're going to work, we divide by efficiency, and we'll talk about why that is. But for this one, we multiply by the efficiency factor. So calculating the cross-sectional area will allow you to get the flow rate. And then the H sub T, that is the amount of head that the turbine can take out of the system. And so it's the elevation difference minus the losses. And usually the way we calculate losses is it's a function of the flow rate. But this is just for simplicity's sake, we say it's a fixed 1.6 meters at the flow rate that we've got. So we've got the turbine head, the efficiency factor, and put it all together, it should be 282.5 kilowatts that this system can generate. Any questions about that one? All right. Another source of renewable energy is uh, wave and tide energy. And we're just right now at the beginning stages of um, exploitation of that resource. And I want to show you a video of a Palamas wave energy converter. They've been used in uh, Portugal, but it was taken out of service after a couple of years because the company that was develop developing it went out of business. <laughs> so hopefully they're able to overcome that. 
The way that this works is, let me dim the light so you can see it a bit better. All right. There are pumps inside of this system. couldn't find the information. I'm not sure. Yeah. The energy can be stored in the same way that energy is stored other ways, you know, like with a battery, a capacitor, uh, making hydrogen. But it's not easy to store energy. Um, you know, if, if you put it into a battery, then there's going to be losses. And so I think what they have to do is they put these relatively close to the shore because uh, there will be cables going on the sea floor to where the energy is used. And so it's not suitable for like in the middle of the ocean all by itself. It has to be relatively close to the populated place where uh, the power is going to be used. They're also testing and developing these in Scotland as well. So Portugal isn't the only place that they've been used before. Uh, but hopefully they get it figured out because 750 kilowatts, that's a lot of power. I mean, that's a, as much power, even with air conditioning, you know, a typical house with the air conditioning going would use 10 kilowatts or less. And so this one could be used for 75 households at like full bore using all the power. And under more normal conditions, maybe your house would be using between 2 and 5 kilowatts. And so it was an interesting, an interesting idea. So that's one technique that's been developed. Okay. Another one is the uh, power buoy. And the way that this power buoy works is it goes up and down with the waves. And there's a gen generator on the inside that, you know, the, the movement of the, uh, the ring around it going up and down uh, starts to spin a flywheel on the inside that generates electricity. And like the uh, Palamas, the power buoy also has to be relatively close to um, where people are going to use the electricity because the cables are going to be going along the ocean floor to wherever people demand electricity. And so um, you can see it's tethered to the bottom and then the waves cause the, the ring to go up and down. You know, there's risks of every kind of, uh, every kind of energy, and I guess one of the risks here is that a ship could run into it. So I assume that they have warning lights, and you know, ships are always checking the radar so they don't have collisions, but you can see it's spinning a little generator on the inside there. These are under development and are being tested in Hawaii. And Hawaii is someplace where they're really interested in renewable energy because electricity from fossil fuels in Hawaii is very, very costly. Like they have some of the highest electrical costs in the world because um, a large fraction of their energy is generated by burning diesel fuel, which until recently had really high prices. It's maybe a little bit lower now, but when you go over Hawaii, you'll notice so many houses already have solar panels on the roof because they're trying to produce some of their own electricity. All right. Another example of using the ocean to generate electricity is uh, what's called a tidal barrage. And the photo that's shown here is a place in France. It's Rance, France. Kind of. I'm sure it's not pronounced that way. They probably have a fancy way of pronouncing it. But the idea here is that uh, it's a river that's connected to the ocean. And at this part, they have uh, really high tides. Like the tide, tidal range is eight meters. So every day, the water level will come up and go down 
through a cycle of eight meters. And it's even higher during what's called a spring tide. A spring tide is uh, a few times per year when the moon is especially close to the earth, the tides are even higher. And I think it's in the range of 9.6 meters when they're having a spring tide. And so by putting a small dam across this uh, river, they open the dam when the tide is high so that the water can flow upstream into the river. And then they close the dam when the tide is at its highest. And so then now they've trapped a bunch of water inside of this river system and the upstream estuary. And so they trap it, and then the water level goes down at the ocean, and now they have an elevation difference. So remember back to our example here, you can generate power by having a flow rate, unit weight of water, and then H sub T depends on an elevation difference. And so tidal power only works when you've got a big difference between uh, the high tide and the low tide. You know, places like here in the UAE, the tidal fluctuations are very, very small. And so it, tidal power wouldn't work on the Gulf in the same way that it can work in France. And there's other places like uh, in Alaska, they have really high tide differences, like on the order of 10 meters or more. So it would be really a, a great place to try and harness this renewable energy resource. In France, this one was built a long time ago. This was built in the late 60s. And since then, they've been generating about 240 megawatts from this installation. And so um, this facility alone accounts for about 1% of France's electricity consumption. Just, it, it seems so simple, right? They put a dam across a river and like that, it's renewable energy for decades and decades to come. Of course, one of the problems with this is that uh, in hydropower, usually when you've got fresh water, uh, you don't have salt in contact with steel. So here, the environment is a lot more corrosive. And so I think that they have uh, problems with having to replace the equipment and the machinery more often than you would in a typical hydropower situation. One of the ideas that your textbook goes into is that of energy equivalence. And this is a table that is in the book that compares some of the different fuels that people use. And this is a, uh, a table that's looking at energy density. So one of the reasons we love natural gas and gasoline is that they have a very, very high energy density. We don't have to carry as much as we would if it was other fuels. You know, another advantage of gasoline is that it's a liquid at standard temperature and pressure. The reason why natural gas isn't used more commonly is that it has to be compressed and held in sort of a, a rugged armored cylinder so that, you know, if it's punctured, then there's a risk of all that gas uh, escaping and it can become an explosion hazard. But uh, liquid fuels are really easy to transport and to use because it's a liquid. Um, so in contrast, some of the very low energy sources like peat have only one-fifth the amount of heat per kilogram. Um, what peat is, is it's kind of like a, a high carbon soil or a, a sort of a turf mixture that's, that was used historically a lot in places like Ireland. And so, um, it's similar to coal, except for it's like a loose coal with lots of impurities and kind of a high moisture content as well. So we're going to use ideas like this on the second part of today's in-class exercise. And um, it's there on the back side of the paper that I've already given you. In this problem statement, I'm asking you to consider a hypothetical. And it's a hypothetical for you, but this was actually a real issue that I faced a few years ago. When I first moved to West Virginia, the house that I live in is far enough away from the city that it doesn't have natural gas. Um, you know, a lot of people have natural gas coming to their house through a pipe, and they use that to heat their house. But I live too far away from the city, and so I had to use propane, which is uh, it's a bottled gas that, it's like cooking gas. They would, uh, the delivery people would bring it to your house, and so that's what you'd burn for the... Uh, for the, the furnace to keep the house warm during the winter time. But it's very expensive, and it can fluctuate a lot depending on the market rate. So in this fictionalization of the same scenario that I faced in the past, 
Uh, in this example, consider what if you lived in northern Canada and in a year spent $1,700 on propane. And that's about what I spent one winter. And uh, we have an average cost in this problem of 55 cents per liter. And the propane furnace is 95% efficient. Let me draw a diagram on the board that shows what that means. 95% efficiency means that only 95% of the heat that comes into your house stays in your house. So here's the house. Heat comes in. And in the case of a furnace, some of the heat goes out through, a, uh, through the exhaust fumes. And so what we're saying is that of the heat that comes in, 5% uh, goes out through the exhaust fumes, and 95% is put into the house itself. And it's eventually lost through the windows and the doors and, um, and things like that. But it stays in the house a lot longer than the heat that is immediately emitted through the exhaust fumes. So in the case of the propane stove, you're going to assume 95% efficiency of, uh, of that furnace. And then you do some research online and find the energy density of propane is 91,500 BTUs per gallon. Has anyone ever heard of a BTU before? It's a unit of heat. It's, it stands for British Thermal Unit. And um, what it is is it's the amount of energy that's required to raise a pound of water one degree Fahrenheit. So it used to be a really common energy measurement uh, unit, but it's becoming less common as people move away from the uh, Fahrenheit and pounds system. Okay, so that's last year. What you need to do is assume you're going to use the same amount of heat in the coming year. You're going to use the same number of BTUs, except for things will be a little bit different. You're going to get that heat from wood fuel instead of from propane. And so you know the energy density of wood, that's given here. We know the efficiency of the wood stove and the cost of wood. So what I'd like you to calculate in two steps, first in part A, calculate how many BTUs you consumed in the prior year. And then in part B, assuming you use the same amount of heat in the following year, how much wood would be required and what would be the price uh, if you spent to purchase that wood. So feel free to collaborate and uh, talk through this problem together. And then we'll take a look at the solution in just a few minutes. Million. Yeah. Okay, let me show you what happened last year. Uh, you can either do this calculation in liters or in gallons. You'll eventually get the same thing, but um, if you go by how much you spent, you can find out the volume of propane that was purchased. And then once you know the volume of propane, you can find out how much heat you purchased. And then of that heat that you purchased, 95% got into the house. And so what that means is that last year, it was about 7.1 times 10 to the 7th BTUs that you put into your house. So you have to put in the same amount of BTUs the following year using wood. And since we're basically out of time, let me just show the solution on the screen. That way it's on to the video if you want to take a look at it later. Um, here you can notice I'm dividing by the efficiency and so what that means is that if it's only 75% efficient, you're going to have to buy a lot more BTUs of heat than you would if the efficiency was higher. So if you need 7.1 going into the house, that means you have to purchase about 9.5 because more of the heat is going out through the exhaust in the case of a wood-burning stove. And so then once you know the number of BTUs required, then you can calculate how many cords that is and eventually calculate the heating cost in terms of dollars. Of this one? Yeah. No, this is how much actually got into the house. 
And so we want to put the same amount of heat into the house in the second year. Because that's mega BTUs. If you look in the problem statement, it says how many MBTUs there are in a cord. So it was in this given here, MBTUs, yeah. OK, that's it for today. Uh, on your way out, will you please put the in-class exercise paper onto this chair? And uh, I'll see you on Thursday. Remember, the reports are due that day. So I guess you'll be busy. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>